This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 279 was recorded July 8th, 2021. I'm Eric Townsend, and this is my new microphone, thanks to our many listeners who alerted us to the problems with the old one. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by escrow.com, the world's most secure online payment system from a counterparty risk perspective because the funds sit in escrow. Victor Schmetz joins me as a first-time feature interview guest this week, and I think you're really going to love this interview. Victor is as well-respected as they come in the world of macro, but he disagrees with my view that we're beginning a 1970s-scale secular inflation event. We'll discuss why not in full detail. Then be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment after the feature interview when Patrick's chart deck is titled Talking Charts. And a quick housekeeping announcement. This episode will air, as usual, by 8 p.m. Thursday evening. But a last-minute glitch in our bulk email system has our production team scrambling today, and there's a very good chance that this week's Research Roundup email will be delayed by several hours or possibly as long as a few days. You can log in to our homepage at macrovoices.com using the account that you registered with and gain access to all that research roundup content on the website, or you can wait until we get the email out to you, and by next week, we'll have this fixed. And I'm Patrick Ceresna. Now, Eric, let's jump to that S&P 500. We got our first sell day in, in what it seems like several weeks. A uh, bit of a reversal. Do you think uh, this is a big turn? No, I think if anything, you know, the first part of what you said is what scares me. The fact that we actually had a down day and it's freaking everybody out because everybody's used to the stock market only goes up. You know, that story has got to end badly someday, but I don't think there's any reason to think it's today. I think the trend is up. I think it's strong. And I don't think at this point we're seeing anything other than a viable dip. I'm not buying it because I'm frankly, not excited about this equity market. I do my investing in uh, other asset classes. But the, as far as I can see, the melt up continues. All right, well, let's move on to the dollar index. Uh, we uh, are still holding decisively above the 92 level, but a uh, little bit of uh, weakness, at least in this morning session, but really a lot of the same from what we saw last week. What's your take on it here? Patrick, my view really hasn't changed much in the last few weeks. I think that the market is trying to assimilate what the latest Fed policy as well as ECB policy really means with respect to this currency pair. I don't think it's really as important as a lot of people are making it out to be. And as long as we're above 89, I don't think there's any reason to have a downside panic. And frankly, I don't see any reason for a huge upside risk either. I, I think that the market is still trying to figure out what all this means. If you look at Bond yields, on the other hand, which we'll come to in a minute, I think there's a signal there that says maybe people are starting to calm down. All right. Well, let's move on to crude oil. On Tuesday, we almost uh, hit 77 on the upside on the August contract, but uh, a little bit of profit taking, at least in over the last couple of days. How do you interpret uh, crude oil's price action and how did the inventory numbers come in? Well, I don't interpret it as profit taking. Here's what's going on in the crude oil market. The big news of the last couple of weeks is OPEC plus trying to have a meeting, which was supposed to happen not this week, but last week. And they, in typical OPEC plus style, they tried to have their meeting and they couldn't come to an agreement and they postponed it and tried to have another one. And that one didn't really happen. And at this point, they've really never quite finished that meeting. At first, okay, if there's no OPEC meeting, there's no decision to increase production. Well, that, that's super bullish. And of course, when the meeting results, with no result and no real plan to have a result, people at first said, this is super bullish. Then Zero Hedge had a, a piece that was posted saying, look, what this really means, guys, is OPEC is failing. It's crumbling. It's about to fall apart. And when OPEC fails, it's going to be a free-for-all. All of the Gulf producers are going to just open the floodgates, produce all that they can, and the market's going to crash. Frankly, as far as I'm concerned, what's really happened here is greed very briefly uh, yielded to fear and doubt because a bunch of people got 
got all upset over nothing. What's really going on here? I think if you want to understand OPEC Plus, although I've never had children myself, I think it's parenting skills. You see what really happened is the United Arab Emirates came to this meeting and said to the rest of the OPEC delegates, we want an increase in our baseline and we're going to have a big hissy fit if we don't get it. And so Saudi Arabia and Russia responded saying, well, neener, 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 we're bigger and tougher than you, so we don't have to give it to you. And then the United Arab Emirates delegate responded by saying, we're going to take our marbles and go home. F you. Okay. Any mother who's been a mother for more than three weeks understands this situation. These children are tired, they need a nap, and they need to be fed, and then everybody will be happy on the playground tomorrow. But that's not the way the crude oil market interprets this. They take this all seriously, treat these people as grown-ups, and assume that maybe it really is true that OPEC is failing. Uh, I don't think that's the case. I think this was a gift to bulls to buy right at the lower channel line, and I think that we're very rapidly going to recover from this and continue back above $80. As we're speaking, Patrick, on Thursday afternoon, we've just passed the futures pit close. Arbob gasoline closed above all of its short-term moving averages. The 5, 8, 13, 21-day moving averages are all below the market now. Arbob has been leading this move, and I think that's a sign of more to come. With respect to WTI crude oil, it's still below that cluster of short-term moving averages, but it's recovered above the volume-weighted moving average and the 21-day moving average, I think that the panic fear is over and it's up from peer and people are going to realize that, you know, the boys and girls at OPEC will eventually get their nap, they'll get fed, and they'll come back and be happy on the playground next week. Maybe next month. We'll see what happens. But as far as the sky is crashing and the world is ending and OPEC is about to, to fail and not exist anymore, uh, I think somebody is reading just a little bit too much Zero Hedge. So, Eric, how did the inventory numbers come in, though? Patrick, it's more of the same, and I think more of what's to come. Big drawdown on crude oil, 6.6 .6 million barrel draw, and a big draw on gasoline, 6.1 million barrels. Distillates was a build, 1.6 million, but on the whole, we still got more than a 10 million barrel drawdown on petroleum products, both crude oil and finished products net. Cushing, Oklahoma, drawing down 614,000 barrels. I think that what we're going to see is more weekly drawdowns of, let's say, between 5 and 10 million barrels for the rest of July. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see some significant draws of bigger than 10 million barrels net, that's both crude and finished products, in August. I think August is going to be a really exciting time in the market. Meanwhile, U.S. production up 200 thousand barrels to 11.3 million barrels. So the predictions of some analysts that we were going to see a big drop off in U.S. production don't seem to be happening now. And in the past, I've said, well, you know, we've got plenty of time left. Well, okay, look, summer's here. If we're going to have a situation where there's a squeeze on prices because of declining U.S. production, it would be in the July-August time frame where the, the big vulnerability was. Looks to me like that feared decline of U.S. production probably is never going to happen. All right, well, let's move on to gold because uh, gold uh, at least has put together a week of uh, upwards uh, price action, retracing a lot of uh, the initial selling. I mean, we got above 1800 temporarily and are trading about 1800 right now as we speak. What are you thinking in terms of what's uh, next for gold? Well, Patrick, it does look on the chart like a nice recovery so far, but you have to ask yourself, okay, is this just a dead cat bounce and we're headed to lower numbers or are we really beginning a recovery? Well, we're above the 5, 8, and 13-day moving averages, the short-term ones, but only by a little bit. We're above the 100-day moving average, but still on a closing basis have stayed below the 21 and well below the 55 and 34, as well as that 200-day moving average, which is a really important one. The 55, 34, and 200 are all clustered together between 8 1829 and 1841. So when we see numbers above 1842, that's when I'm going to say, okay, it really looks to me technically like the uh, the, the reaction to the Fed sell-off is over and the uh, the bull market has resumed. At this point, I still think there's potentially the room for a reversal in lower numbers before this is over. All right. Well, let's uh, wrap up by uh, talking about these 10-year Treasury yields because uh, we finally see some almost acceleration in rates of downside as bonds are uh, outright breaking out. And we, we're trading below the uh, one spot 3.0 on the yields here. Uh, what's your take on uh, what's going on in the bond market? 
Well, Patrick, this pretty much confirms what I've said in the last few episodes, which is now that we're comfortably below one spot 50 on the 10-year yield, I think basically everybody got the message to just chillax about the bond market crash. That's not really happening. The bond market has maybe topped out. But if you look at what happened the last time interest rates bottomed, it was like 10 years before there was really a significant trend in the opposite direction. I don't think there's any reason to think that. I think we had a big scare that is now ending about bond yields you know, going to the moon because of the amount of money that the Biden administration is going to spend. People have woken up to what we said on Macro Voices months ago, which is, don't worry, they're not going to tax people to spend that money. They're going to print more. And uh, I think that's exactly what the market is finally digesting. This week's feature interview guest is Victor Schwetz. Now, Eric, why did we invite Victor on the show this week? Well, Victor has been around this industry for a long, long time, far longer than you and I have, Patrick. He's a very well-respected guy, and most importantly, he disagrees with us, and that's what we look for. Best investor practice is never to look for people who agree with you so you can feel smart. It's to look for smart people who disagree with you so you can find out what's wrong with your own view. Victor's a guy who sees a lot of the world the way I do, but he does not share my secular inflation view at all. And I was so excited to really get a a strong, credible guy who understands what this is all about, who can really make a cogent argument as to why he doesn't see the runaway inflation risk that I see in coming years. So that was really my focus. And frankly, Victor exceeded my expectations. We covered that and a number of other topics. I think you're going to love this one, guys. Well, Eric's interview with Victor is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Abex Technologies. In addition to sponsoring Macro Voices, Abex also produces Smarter Markets, a weekly podcast that airs every Saturday morning on all the major podcast platforms. Smarter Markets brings together the leading minds in macroeconomics, technology, and commodities to explore how capital markets can be redesigned to better serve market participants and society as a whole. Michelle Dennity's five-part series about the role of digital innovation in advancing the ESG economy is live now at smartermarketspod.com, and you can look for another terrific interview every Saturday morning. But you won't get Smarter Markets on your Macro Voices feed. You have to subscribe separately to Smarter Markets in your podcast app in order to listen to this free podcast. And now, with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Victor Schwetz, who heads up Asia Pacific and Global Equity Strategy for Macquarie Investments in Hong Kong. Victor, it's great to have you on the program as a first-time guest. I've been asking all of our guests to tell me about inflation versus deflation, which, boy, it seems like it's just the, the big debate in finance that keeps coming back. How do you see this? Are we, as many of us think, headed into secular inflation, or is it just a false alarm? Well, it's neither of those things. I I personally think that inflation, disinflation pendulum, in other words, swinging from one side to the other uh, and returning very quickly back to disinflation will be the story of almost the rest of our lives. If you have a career that is going on for at least the next 10 years, that's going to be your story. Uh, And the reason for that, Eric, is very simple. The last 20 years was very straightforward from my perspective. Uh, This was a period of extreme financialization, a period of extreme digitization, and also extreme globalization. All of those forces were incredibly disinflationary. And so the only time inflation had any chance was during recoveries, like when you recover suddenly from global financial crisis or dot com. But otherwise, inflation really had no chance at all. Now, the next 10, possibly 20 years will be different. We're not going back to 1970s. Today's world is so dramatically different. Demographics is different. Debt levels, financialization are different. Government policies are different. Technology and its impact is different. So we're not going back to 1970s. But whatever is going to happen in the next 10, 20 years will be different to the previous period. Why is that? Well, we still have a lot of disinflation. The backdrop remains disinflationary. 20 years from now, everything will be at zero. And where does it come from? 
Well, demographics is mildly disinflationary. You have financialization and debt, which is highly disinflationary. And of course, we have technology and information age. But unlike the previous 20 years, going forward, there are some inflationary elements. What are they? Well, essentially three. Number one, unlike the previous 20 years, where we essentially just were manipulating digits of information and data, the next 10 to 20 years will be much more capital intensive. In other words, we'll be starting to manipulate physical matter, atoms. Its example of that will be alternative energy and transportation platform, elimination of factories on a global basis and supply and value chains. Uh, it's going to be Infotech merging with uh, Biotech. It's going to be robotics, automation. So it's a completely different environment. Now, it requires a lot more investment. The last 20 years, there was no need to invest much money uh, other than into intangible assets. The next 20 years actually requires more investment. Now, that investment which we're going to make in this digital age, creating physical things, such as I said, elimination factories, supply chains, robotics, automation, that investment ultimately will be very disinflationary. But initially, it could actually be inflationary. So that's number one. Number two, fiscal policies. Remember, the last 20 years, fiscal policy was playing second fiddle. It really didn't play a major role. Going forward, essentially society's demand that the government takes the excess capital that we have accumulated, and today we have at least five, ten times more capital than we need, and put it exactly where people want it, rather than sort of remaining in the cloud of finance the way it had been over the last 20 years. So the government will be more aggressive in fiscal policy, whether it's universal basic income guarantees, whether it's going to be uh, healthcare spending, whether it's going to be some infrastructure spending, whether it's going to be uh, basic research and fundamental research, they're going to be spending money in a number of areas. Again, that's more inflationary. And the third element, is a deglobalization and localization. That's going to continue to strengthen. So what you have in the next 10 to 20 years, two very powerful forces are going to struggle. One is very strong long-term disinflationary force, which ultimately is going to win. And the other one is more inflation created from various things we're going to do over the next 10 to 20 years. Now, the interesting question, Eric, is who is going to decide whether inflation or disinflation wins? at any given point in time. Now, my personal view for quite some time has been that private sector will never walk again uh, unassisted. That is, velocity of money will never, be, will never improve through private sector. Now, we can debate why I think private sector will never walk again, but if you take it for granted that that only leaves the public sector as an arbiter, as a determiner, whether inflation or disinflation will win in any given six months or three months period. So if you were to ask me, do I believe there is systemic inflation? No. Do I believe there is systemic disinflation? Yes. Do I believe that there will be times uh, when inflation will be stronger than disinflation? Uh, yes. And the swings in the pendulum from one to the other in the next 10, 20 years will be much stronger, in my view, than what we experienced in the previous 20 years. You made some really excellent points, and I'm going to want to come back to several of them in a minute. But first, there was something you said in there. Maybe I misheard you, but I thought at one point you said, in the next 20 years, because of disinflation, I thought you said everything goes to zero. Yes. Uh, what exactly do you mean by that? I mean, assets all cost nothing? I mean, what do you mean? No. Uh, well, essentially what I mean, uh, one of the things uh, technology does very successfully and remember, what we've done with financialization that, we've, with, that we embarked on in 1980s and carried on to today and will continue to carry on, one of the things financialization does is massively reduces cost of capital. And technology itself is a human spirit. But this, the pace, the speed with which technology propagates really depends on the cost of capital. So if one agrees with me that cost of capital must fall forever, then it's like pouring a kerosene on a, on, a, on a bonfire of technological age. And what technology does incredibly well is reduce marginal pricing power of both labor and capital and corporates and brands. And so what happens over time, those reduction in marginal pricing power converges into average pricing power, which also declines. And eventually almost everything becomes free. Uh, there is no prices 
just like information today is almost entirely free, just like uh, publications today almost entirely free, just like trading on the New York Stock Exchange, quite, not quite, but almost entirely free. Uh, just like uh, a lot of music uh, is almost entirely free. So we already have massively reduced marginal pricing power in a lot of industries. We already reduced marginal pricing power of labor. Part of the reason why Phillips curve doesn't work is that uh, every day you sit in the chair, your price, marginal pricing power declines. Eventually, those declines in marginal pricing power will translate into average pricing power. And so almost everything will gravitate towards zero. Now, at that point, you don't need corporates. Why do you need corporates for? They're there in order to reduce transaction costs. They're there in order to mobilize resources. But if transaction costs are next to zero and we have excess capital, which I said earlier, at least five, ten times larger than what we require, uh, why do you need corporations that live in their own names for hundreds of years? So all I'm saying is that everything goes eventually to zero. And that's, uh, you can call it communism if you want. One of the ideas of Karl Marx back from 1850s was that eventually we'll come to the stage that what he would describe as a slavery of labor or capital, which has disappeared. And the reason it disappears, not because you have a socialist revolution, uh, but simply because productivity rates are so incredibly high that basically uh, there is nothing to do. John Maynard Keynes in the 1930s uh, was discussing something very similar that was in four generations. Our sort of uh, future generations, uh, the biggest test they will have is uh, what to do with themselves and how to feel satisfied and valuable in a world where they contribute very little. If you think of Peter Drucker in 1980s, 90s, they were discussing the same thing. So whether it's Karl Marx of 1850s, John Maynard Keynes in 1930s, or Peter Drucker in 1990s, the idea was similar, that eventually productivity will mushroom to a stage that neither capital nor labor uh, are required in the same magnitude. Neither they are priced the same way. Uh, the jobs as such uh, evaporate. And I think we're within two decades, maybe three decades of reaching it. But that progression is incredibly tough. Uh, the way I describe it uh, in one of my books is to say, if you landed in London in the early 1800s and find Luddites just about to smash a loom, and if you came to those Luddites and said, you know what, please don't do it. Within 30, 40 years, everything is going to be fine. Uh, they probably will smash your hair. Because for them, that 30, 40 years was the entire lifespan. Uh, and so when people say those sorts of transition to in capital and labor that we are experiencing have been experienced many times before, very true. But number one, we don't feel the pain of people who physically had to go through it. And it just happens to be our life that we will experience now. And number two, the waterfront of changes is so dramatically wider. So we don't just reducing marginal pricing power of cotton or steam or railways. We're not just reducing marginal pricing power of chemicals or pharmaceuticals. We're reducing marginal pricing power of everything. That's why McKinsey, in their review, uh, was estimating that the impact of information age could be 3,000 times the impact of industrial age. In other words, much broader and much faster. 300 times broader, 10 times faster. Uh, and so when I say everything goes to zero, eventually the productivity growth rates will be so high that uh, there will be no need to value any of that stuff. And the economists are not going to function the same way as they've done over the last two, 300 years. But that is decades away. In the meantime, we're living in a twilight zone. We still have our old-fashioned liberal capitalism ideas, what the market's supposed to be like, what the corporates are supposed to be like, what the industry is supposed to, how they're supposed to function, and the new world. And the new world already making its impact felt. For example, as I said, look at what happened to all the digital industries and what they've done to marginal pricing power of labor and capital over the last 20 years. Just imagine what manipulation of physical matter and atoms will do over the next 20 years. And, and so, so to me, that's what I meant by, uh, by zero. It's a society of incredibly high productivity. Prior to first industrial revolution, productivity only grew about 10 bips per annum. After the first industrial revolution, call it 1850s, 1860s, it increased about 100 basis points. After the second industrial revolution, it increased to 200 basis points. Today, we're back down to only about 50 basis points. And the reason for that 
when you are at an earlier to middle stage of that evolution, whether it's first industrial revolution, second or information age, productivity actually goes down, not up. And the reason for that is very simple. Part of the economy becomes so efficient, so productive, so at the front of everything that they effectively uh, cut everybody in the economy down one piece at a time. And you have to wait for the overall economy to get to a certain stage before aggregate productivity could will start accelerating again. And to me, that's probably 10, 20 years out, but eventually we're going to get to that point. Okay, I see a theme in what you're saying that I'd really like to understand, because in your answer just now, you said a number of things about a trend that we're going to see toward much less independence uh, of private business and much, much more centralization. And then earlier, you said you made a prediction that the private sector will never, I think you said, walk unassisted ever again. So we're describing a change from a type of society that focuses on individual responsibility and self-sufficiency and moving in the direction of collectivism and uh, more social support programs, uh, more in the direction uh, of socialism. I totally, completely agree with you that that's exactly what's happening. It's a, the, the big trend. I can't figure out what it is that drives this. I mean, when I was a kid, it seemed like individualism was in. Now, all of a sudden, everybody wants collectivism. And when, when I was a kid, no American w would say, hey, you know, we'd be better off to, to really look at socialism as being better than capitalism. What is causing the change in, uh, I don't know if it's economic behavior or just social attitude that suddenly, all of a sudden, you know, right now, socialism's in, communism might be the next. Yeah, you're totally, you're totally correct, Eric. There is quite a few uh, influences, very powerful influences that drive it. You have to remember that in the second half of 1940s, 1950s, and call it the first half of 1960s, there was a very strong consensus in the U.S. and most other Western societies. And that consensus was essentially about the government, that the government has a very special role to perform uh, that private sector generally should be mistrusted, and that uh, you as an individual is pre are prepared to sacrifice certain freedoms in order to see uh, whether it's middle class creation, uh, health care opportunity, educational opportunity, and, and the rest of it. And so U.S. was not a liberal society. You have to remember that in the 1950s, if you're deviant in any form, whether it's political, socially, sexually, you could go to prison very easily. If you were against the ideology of the United States, in some states, uh, that would have led to capital punishment. If you were found to be a member of certain undesirable groups, you would lose your job. I mean, Secretary of State in 1950s proudly declared that they fired one homosexual every day. Uh, and society as a whole accepted certain limitations. And the reason they accepted certain limitations, because those societies remembered 1920s and 30s, and they remembered how bad private sector can be, how misallocation of capital could be so horrible in a private sector-driven world. And so the first macroeconomists to come through, including uh, John Maynard Keynes, including uh, Galbraith, they never believed that a public sector is always necessarily not as good at allocating capital. They never believed that public sector necessarily always inferior to private sector. And then around 19, mid-1960s, the baby boomers started their uprising. And basically what they've done is ushered the new world, uh, the way I describe it, the world of freedom, choice, and efficiency. And they basically were saying, look, you don't tell me who I should marry or who I should marry. You can't tell me what job I should take. You can't just keep me down and not allow me to immigrate or move from country to country or take my money with me. Uh, and so baby boomers ushered a different age. Now, between 19 1965 and 1980, complete chaos ruled. And the reason you had chaos is because society couldn't agree. Uh, there were part of society that wanted uh, a baby boomers agenda, but there was another part of society which was extremely conservative uh, and still look back to 1950s uh, and 1940s rather than into 1970s. Uh, around 1980, a new consensus was formed, and it's really on baby boomers' shoulders 
that Milton Friedman and Roll Coast become very famous. On their shoulders, Ronald Reagan, Maggie Thatcher, and all the rest of them got elected. Uh, and the new consensus formed. And the new consensus was basically baby boomers consensus, choice, efficiency, freedom. Uh, and that was the age when suddenly public sector was the enemy, government was the enemy. Uh, it was also that if there is any problem, private sector solution to that problem is always better than the public sector solution. Now, that consensus started to break down around global financial crisis, and we've really been living in a chaotic times uh, for at least in that last 12 years, 13 years. And we have another at least 10 years to go. Uh, and the reason we have this chaotic stage is that millennium and Z generations basically reject the baby boomers uh, bargain. They argue much more in favor of what I describe as fairness, equality, and no waste. This is a very different way of looking at it compared to freedom, choice, and efficiency. And millennials and Z generations increasingly have electoral pool. Uh, so, for example, in the U.S., about 20% of the votes in the latest elections was cost by those people. But if you wait another eight years or so, they will become a plurality. And at that point, an AOC-style presidency will be almost guaranteed. And so do you have this generational change? Yes, very similar what happened in 40s, 50s, 60s, and then to baby boomers from 80s onwards, we have another major shift. Now, part of the reason why younger generations feel like that, because just like people in 1940s who remembered 1920s and 30s, younger generation have seen global financial crisis. They, they saw unwinnable wars. They saw dot-com crisis. Uh, they saw pandemics. And so for that younger generation, government is not an enemy. It's a guardrail that actually helps you, that actually supports you, uh, whereas private sector, they understand, is not always best in solving, in solving the problems. Now, part of the reason we have all of this as well is that in 1980s, we decided to financialize. In 50s, 60s, and 70s, even into early 80s, U.S. only needed, and pretty much any other country in the world, only needed about a dollar, dollar fifty of debt and liquidity for every dollar of GDP. And then we decided to financialize. It started with Paul Walker, uh, and then the real push forward was the Green Spread put, which was uh, put in uh, after Black Monday uh, in 1987. And after that, uh, we've gone berserk. Money supply has been growing much faster than nominal GDP everywhere around the world. And so today, in some countries, we need $5 of debt and liquidity for every dollar of GDP. If you think of financialization, even in the U.S., it's almost 10 times uh, you need. And so part of the problem we're experiencing is that we've decided to inflict uh, on ourselves a sort of a self-inflicted wound. Financialization is not something we should have done. But we never really debated that in 1980s and 90s. We just stumbled into it. Now, why is it bad? Well, financialization massively distort income and wealth inequalities. If you happen to have assets, you're doing incredibly well, particularly if they are digital assets. If, on the other hand, you're basically relying on nominal GDP, wages, and household chattels, you're doing very, very poorly. Uh, and the gap between the two are rising. The other thing which financialization does, not only income and wealth inequality, it crushes the cost of capital. That by itself starts accelerating massively technological innovation, not inventiveness, innovation, two, two very different things. And as technological innovation started to proliferate, technology started to have a massive disintermediating impact on labor, on capital, on products, on brands. Um, and so what the new generation is seeing is a negative impact of financialization. What they're seeing is a negative impact of technology and information age. What they're seeing is massively distorted uh, labor markets uh, where there is no clarity of professions, jobs, progression paths. What they're also seeing is geopolitical and social pressures because when income and wealth inequality increase dramatically and when you have the problems of disintermediation, that creates Maslowian disappointment. In other words, people within the same country move at different speeds. It's your Ohio versus New York, or Sydney versus Brisbane, or London versus Birmingham. And also different countries move at different speed. Now, that basically creates geopolitical and social tensions at the same time. 
And so this younger generation is basically saying, oh my God, uh, we're facing so much stuff. The only party that can actually make a difference in this game is the government. And that is why the role of the government will continue to increase. And by the way, uh, I think the younger generation is correct. We will know ultimately how inefficient or efficient is going to be. Uh, but there's no question that the government role will rise. I'm very curious whether you're familiar with Neil Howe's work in The Fourth Turning, the book that he wrote in 1998, which I'm a big fan of. Seems to me there's a lot of echoes here in that he says things are mostly about generational cycles. His prediction has been that the 2020s would basically be the decade where people lose faith in and tear down old and uh, dated institutions, and the younger generation rebuilds a new future, very similar to what happened after World War II, where a lot of both social and business norms were kind of abandoned and we invented new ways of doing things. Is that consistent? Is that kind of how you see this? And are there any differences in the way Howe looks at this versus how you see it? Yeah, I, I know the book and, and absolutely uh, generational change uh, make dramatic difference. But to me, what makes generational change count is really uh, finance, economy and technology. Those things don't necessarily move at the, at the same speed as generations. It's very easy sort of to, to rationalize it looking backwards. But to me, those are the drivers. Those are the key components. So, for example, if in 1980s I've come out and said, you know what, U.S. productivity has been falling since 1970s. You really don't deserve the money you're making. And you really don't deserve to have the wealth you have. Uh, but believe me, by not insisting on the growth rates, that you're insisting on, we're all going to be better off. Now, how many votes would I have attracted? Probably myself and my mother. That's about it. Uh, and so the easiest thing back in, that, in those days was to say there is a solution. And a solution is financialization. It's assets. We're going to hook ourselves to an asset train. Now, that's a decision that didn't have to be made. Uh, it's a decision that we've decided to make. And so the question always becomes, what would have happened if we didn't make the choice? Or maybe that was already predisposed by baby boomers because they insisted on forever growth. They insisted on forever wealth. So I always have a difficulty necessarily spacing it like, uh, like how does and saying, well, there are periods, there is this period, there is this period, because there is, I think, quite a lot of free will involved as well. Uh, and things could have been different. The timings could have been different. But the basic essence that as economies fluctuate, there are times of massive significant shifts. On the other hand, there are times when everything is incredibly placid. And, and we are going into much stronger change. I think it's, uh, as I said, I think it's 3,000 times the impact of industrial revolution. And so what happens to generations after millennium in Z generation, I don't think that can be predicted because societies will be so fundamentally different. Economies will be so fundamentally different. Think of it this way. The essence of capitalism is capital and labor. If neither capital nor labor function the same way, it's no longer capitalism. It's something else. Uh, and the only question is, what is it? And you can put a label of socialism. You can put a label of communism. You can put a label, label of enlightenment. There are many labels you can put together, but it certainly is not going to be something that we've experienced over the last 300 years. So I'm not totally sure how that will change what the following generations actually will experience. Victor, something that's always fascinated me, I, I'm in my mid-50s and most of my peers in my age group in finance, you know, they roll their eyes and they just say, oh, these stupid kids, they don't understand anything. They don't appreciate you know, the importance of capitalism. And that's what made Americans strong. And, and they'll learn someday. And I just listen to them. I think, you know, I happen to agree with the capitalistic view, but um, I think they're kind of missing the story. What's going on here is the younger generation is sick of this, and they're going to rebuild things, whether old guys like me like it or not. And it's fascinating to me how much of the finance community, I think, underestimates the willpower of millennials and younger generations to just say no to the status quo. Now, Victor, you are known as a thematic outlook kind of guy. With this backdrop that we've talked about, where there's kind of a new generation that's not in power yet, that we both think is headed into power, it's a very different social attitude of what kinds of institutions they would like to implement. 
where does it take us, both in terms of capital markets as well as, you know, something like Fed policy? Most people are still in a waiting game of, okay, when are they going to start the taper to normalize their balance sheet back down to zero? And I think about, you know, <laughs> when does it hit infinity? I, I'm not sure there's a reason it ever goes the other way. That's right. That's right. The, the way I basically describe it, people say, uh, when is going to be comeuppance? We've done so many terrible things. The price must be paid. Why? Why should it be paid? Well, we can't just carry debt. It must be repaid. Uh, I basically say to those people, have you ever heard of BOJ? Have you heard of Federal Reserve? We accumulated in various financial instruments well over 400, one could argue five, six hundred trillion dollars piece of paper globally. Do you ever think any of that ever going to get repaid? The answer is absolutely no. And so what Federal Reserve and other central banks have gone through is a process of just using financialization to spice up growth rates and deliver what societies want to be delivered to understanding that now we are hooked on asset prices, that household decision, whether to consume or to save, investment decisions by corporate, whether to invest or do share buybacks, are much more driven by asset prices rather than anything else. And so the more you hook yourself on asset prices, the less volatility of asset prices you can tolerate. So when I was a younger man, and I'm older than you, but when I was a younger man, you know, moves of 100, 200 basis points were very common. Today, we can't even survive 20 basis points, forget anything else. And so central banks are caught in a system that they have created, but nevertheless, something that baby boomers asked them to create. So when people say, who is the guilty party? I usually say, look yourself in the mirror, it's you. And so they've created a system that essentially cannot be unhooked. And the more we rely on asset classes, the less volatility central banks can tolerate. Eventually, on that path, the only acceptable answer is zero volatility. There is no other acceptable answer that you can find. Uh, and so central banks have to continuously generate more liquidity and capital for ever diminishing returns, which means that the cost of capital must continue to fall forever. Now, people say, well, it can't go on. Well, uh, why, why it can't go on? It can go on uh, and it will go on. And so, so the question then becomes, OK, uh, so what happens to asset prices? Uh, and I say, look, it's very simple. Uh, if you have zero risk free rate and zero risk premium, what is the value of an asset? Well, theoretically, it's infinite. And I said, well, think about just keep that in the back of your mind and think of asset classes. Now, there will be, however, a significant differentiation in performance. And what I mean by that, uh, I don't like gross label. I don't like value label. I don't like quality value, quality label. Uh, I think all of that is obsolete. Because something that you think is gross could become value, something which is value could become gross, uh, etc. Uh, but what is important is that whether you're new economy driven or whether you are old economy driven. And some of the old economy companies can do much, much better by embracing the new economy. But most companies don't have a capability of doing that. They're fossilized or they, uh, everything they do is so big that whatever new comes in, it just doesn't move the needle. And so the interesting thing to me is, in all of that, is that it's highly disinflationary, what I've just described. A government occasionally will step in, and more and more as we go forward, and governments, through a variety of, uh, of things they do, will generate more inflation, but then it will fall off again, and disinflation will get stronger and stronger and stronger. At the end of this process, there is no capital markets, effectively, because everything is either infinite or zero. You're either worth everything or you're worth nothing. Corporates will no longer be 100-year institutions, but they will be like flashes in the sky. A good idea, come up, burn out in 6, 12 months, off you go, the next one comes on. So it's going to be a very different market. Uh, but having said that, as I said, in the shorter term, if you start looking more like 6 months, 12 months, 2 years, 3 years out, it is still the case that whatever government does will switch you between different asset classes. But if you don't want to try to anticipate what the government will do, if you, don't, if you feel you don't have any um, edge, there is a way of investing in not necessarily just cutting edge technology, but in companies that embrace the new age, embrace the new economy. Uh, the other thing to highlight, I think, uh, is important. Whenever people say, I think we need to rebase the economy, 
my answer to them, okay, do you understand that your 401k then will be worth nothing? Are you okay with that? Because the whole idea of money supply growing so much faster than nominal GDP is a difference between those two numbers is really assets. So are you okay if we try to converge those two lines that your 401k is worth nothing? Uh, most people will say they're not okay with that. Are you okay that your house that you might have bought for $100 probably is not worth more than $30? Are you okay with that? Uh, most people will argue no. So everybody who argues about resetting the economy basically need to confront the fact that social, economic, and political consequences of doing is just astronomic and cannot even be contemplated in any rational, in any rational sense. So to me, ultimately, Capital markets will be nationalized in, in various forms. They're already too dangerous to be left to private sector to, uh, to, to regulate itself or, or to even participate. Uh, think today, if Federal Reserve fix the price of money and they don't like the quantity that private sector gives them, they just create quantity. If they create quantity, they don't like the price, they fix the price. So if you fix both price and quantity, why do we need the prime dealers for? Well, the answer is well, there are still some private sector signals we want to maintain. The same applies to uh, a fiscal policy. Why fiscal policy generates debt? Does it need to generate debt uh, in, any, in any meaningful form? And so we can go through the list uh, and basically argue that a lot of those private sector signals that already atrophied in the last 15 or 20 years will continue to atrophy. And as those signals atrophy, who will take the place of private sector? Well, the answer is public sector will take the place. Now, is it going to be a disaster and people say it's going to be like 1970s? Well, it could be. Uh, but on the other hand, it doesn't have to be. And so one of the things I keep on discussing, whether we need freedom in order to be wealthy, prosperous, innovative. The answer over the last 500 years, absolutely yes. Uh, but is it still the answer as we go forward? Victor, you did such a great job of answering a question that was about, can it go on forever, that I just can't resist asking you the big question. So many people in macro will tell you, look, Victor, you've been in this game a long time. You remember 15% treasury yields in the early 80s. We've gone from 15% to zero, well, almost zero. What was the low was, what, 35 basis points or right. something? Surely this has got to be the time to just back up the leverage truck and massively short treasuries because the only possible direction for interest rates is up. Now, I personally don't agree with that at all, but a lot of people do. What do you think? Well, it reminds me what people were saying about Japan. Remember, in 1990s, in early 2000, the view was that if, God forbid, Japan ever ignites inflation, they immediately go bankrupt because the government will be spending 50, 60, 70 percent of their budget just servicing the debt. Now, how much do we think Japanese government today is spending on servicing debt? Four percent. Four. Not 50, not 40, not 80. Four. Uh, and the debt burden is much, much larger than what it used to be. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, Japan is unique. Okay, let's look at Eurozone. How, how unique is Eurozone? Look at the UK. How unique is the United Kingdom? And, and, and if you think of US, one of the things that is becoming very clear is that what happened in Japan since the early 90s, what happened in Eurozone since global financial crisis, over the last five or six years started to happen in the US as well. And a basic sort of signal that the U.S. is sending now, just like the other economies do, it's not about supply of money. It's about demand for money. It's not about supply of credit. It's about demand for credit. Uh, and increasingly, the more we leverage, the more we financialize, the more we erode marginal demand for credit. Now, what that implies is that interest rates, not only they cannot go up, but they will not go up. And by the way, if they do, uh, remember, we always have perpetuals, which have no value at all because they're never redeemable. On the horizon, we have MMT or modern monetary theory. Uh, we already have BOJ. Remember, BOJ has been monetizing more debt than the government of Japan has been issuing. Uh, that's why they're sitting on 52, 53 percent of JGB market. Eventually, you don't need a JGB market at some point in time. Why do you need? Why do you need the bond market at all? And so to me, when people say that surely it must break out, yes, if we live in a liberal capitalist economy, absolutely. 
Uh, the way I looked at people in 1990s who were projecting that yen will balloon to three, 400 as the only way to reflate, uh, the way I look at them is to say your prescription or your view what yen is going to do or interest rates are going to do, it was absolutely appropriate for 1960s, 70s, 80s. We do not live in 1960s, 70s, 80s. And to assume that this is immutable truth that is true in any era is just wrong. So my answer is look at Japan. And, and if you look at Japan, ask yourself, how different is U.S. to Japan? Now, a lot of people say U.S. have a younger demographics. Well, actually, the U.S. demographics today is equivalent to Japan of 1990s when Japan had huge deflationary bust. Also, by 2030, U.S. demographic deteriorating so fast that it will be equivalent to Japan's demographics in 2010. Uh, and Eurozone is only slightly worse than the United States. Is. So demographic is not the question. Secondly, people say debt level. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, Japan had four times the debt to GDP in 1990s. U.S. only had two. But today's U.S. at four times. And remember, U.S. has a lot of unfunded liabilities. If you include that, U.S. is actually closer to six times. So that's not really the argument. The third thing people say, what about public versus private sector? U.S. is much more private sector oriented. Well, actually, U.S. Uh, public sector spending is now 48% of GDP, higher than in Japan, higher than the U.K., and only slightly lower than the likes of France uh, or, or Germany have. Uh, a lot of people say U.S. is more productive. Well, not true. Multi-factor productivity in the U.S. over the last 10 years was lower than either in Germany uh, or in, in Japan. And so if you look at it, inventiveness, well, U.S. is much more inventive. Uh, but innovation is actually not that dissimilar to what you have in Eurozone and Japan. So I, I can't see why U.S. will be so much different to either Japan or Eurozone. And it's not even clear how do you fix a problem. Because if fiscal spending was a way to fix a the problem, then Japan would have done it, right? They had 30 supplementary budgets. A lot of people say mixing fiscal and monetary aggressively is a way to go forward. Well, if that was the case, Japan, again, has been doing it for quite a period of time. Uh, Paul Krugman's been arguing being credibly irresponsible is a way to go forward. Well, since 2012, Eurozone was fairly irresponsible. Again, that did not fix the problem. Uh, so, so to me, I understand what people say, and I myself lived through the ages when interest rates were 15% or even high in some of the countries I lived in. And that's why I was saying 100 basis points move or 200 basis points move were okay. Uh, but that is not our world. And that world is not going to return. The only way to try to reset the economy is either you have to have um, understanding that we're going to bust it up and have a massive deflation bust, irrespective of the consequences, or we have a war. Uh, that's the only way you can actually do it. Victor, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. Before I let you go, though, I know you uh, basically head up the Asia-Pacific and uh, global equity strategy at Macquarie in Hong Kong. For our institutional audience, how can they follow your work, get in contact with you, and so forth? The best way, Eric, is, uh, of course, Macquarie. Uh, I published uh, a variety of, of documents. Some of them are reasonably well known uh, and, and regular. What caught my eye uh, comes out a couple of times a month. I publish rights, wrongs, and returns uh, three or four times a year, which looks more at portfolio allocation and strategy. We also do a lot of ad hoc pieces. So Macquarie Bank will be uh, the best way to follow it. And, of course, the research products that Victor just described are institutional research only available to institutional investors. For our retail audience, I cannot strongly enough recommend Victor's book, The Great Rupture, Three Empires, Four Turning Points, and the Future of Humanity, which is available on Amazon and other booksellers. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. Escrow.com is the payment system for buying and selling anything of value. Cars, boats, airplanes, jewelry, gemstones, fine art, collectibles, intellectual property rights, domain names, bringing in shipping containers from overseas, or even buying and selling entire businesses. It's simple to use. Either party sets up the transaction. Then the buyer sends the funds to escrow.com. The seller is then instructed to send the goods to the buyer to inspect. Within the inspection period, the buyer can return the items for any reason. After that, 
escrow.com pays the seller immediately. Escrow.com is the world's most secure payment system from a counterparty risk perspective because the funds sit in escrow. Over 2 million customers have transacted over $5 billion on escrow.com, and eBay and Shopify use it for cars, boats, luxury watches, and business sales. It's available in the United States, Canada, and Australian dollars, euros, and British pounds. Never buy or sell anything online unless you use escrow.com. Escrow.com is a subsidiary of Freelancer.com, listed on the OTCQX Best Markets under the ticker symbol FLNCF and the Australian Securities Exchange under the ticker FLN. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have Victor on the show. He just uh, brings to light so many of the disinflationary pressures that still exist in the system. And maybe there is still a lot of, of, of the same kind of returning Japanese pressures that may still prevail in this cycle. What did you take away from the interview? Well, I thought that Victor's metaphor of the swinging pendulum and applying it to this particular scenario was just particularly pertinent because that really is what this comes down to. If you don't think that we're seeing some kind of, of inflation trend here, frankly, you're blind. So what's going on? Either it's just the beginning of a big secular trend or the pendulum has already swung too far. We're at extremes, which is exactly where markets like to trick people in and get them to make the wrong decision before the pendulum swings the other way. That's exactly the right way to think about this. And it happens that Victor and I have opposite views of which of those is true. But listening to why it could be just a pendulum swing situation, which is, you know, how many times in the last 10 years have I thought about the risk of secular inflation? Because I think what, once it does start to run away, it really ties the central banker's hands and we have a big problem. So I've been very concerned about this for more than a decade. Am I just biasing myself to say, OK, I'm sure I see it happening when really it's just a pendulum swing? Or is it? more the case that no, actually, uh, it really is a secular trend. I'm still on uh, on my case, but I really learned a lot from, from Victor's perspective, and it helped me to see the other side of this argument much more persuasively than I'd understood it previously. In any event, Patrick, I want to get on now to our post-game chart deck. Listeners, you know you normally can find the download link in your Research Roundup email. That Research Roundup email, we hope to get to you just as soon as we can. We're having a technical problem. If you need to get to it, you can just log in to the website at macrovoices.com. Use the same username and password that you're registered with when you first set up your account. You'll be able to find all that content that's supposed to be in Research Roundup right there on the website. And the Research Roundup email will go out just as soon as we can get our bulk email system fixed, hopefully uh, not too long after this episode airs. Patrick, the chart deck is called Talking Charts. Let's talk charts. <laughs> All right. Well, I just wanted to first start off uh, with some reference to the S&P 500. And obviously, uh, we started the day with a pretty big red candle. We've uh, been able to retrace uh, at least half of the early losses and uh, ask the question as to whether uh, we're beginning some sort of market correction. And I think the first thing I want to really address is that uh, market corrections happen. And uh, it's not uh, about being super bare or that the market has to go through a COVID-style market crash and a 20-30% wipeout. But very commonly, the stock markets will have these 5 to 10% market corrections in the process of trading. And so we're simply identifying the different cycles that we're in. The way I kind of perceive it is that the, this market is a little bit overdone and the market breadth is, is actually deteriorating. And the stocks that were the leadership, which are the FANG stocks, and I know uh, the acronym of FANG, doesn't include Microsoft, but really we're just talking about these big growth companies that are the big behemoths in the NASDAQ have truly been the leadership and they still continue to be like even with today's down day, Amazon was still at new highs and, uh, and Apple and Microsoft both holding, all of them are holding near their highs. And, uh, and we haven't seen them yet begin the correction. But in my mind, we are in the summer doldrums. And it's very likely that we're going to see some sort of mean reverting correction from this 
impulse higher uh, simply because there isn't enough momentum in the broader markets to keep this going. So it would be interesting. I put on a 50-day moving average just uh, to just uh, give an idea of where all the corrections throughout the year have initially found support. But what is interesting is, is that when we get into a more meaningful market correction, often we spend uh, some uh, prolonged period such as several weeks below the 50-day moving average in a correction. And it'll be really interesting to see whether the sell-off that began here today, whether this is the beginning of one of these corrections that will create sort of a, a summer consolidation period in the markets. And, and, uh, and the, this is a, one of those interesting turn points where, where it's something like this can happen. So I'm, uh, we're going to be watching to see whether this follows through. I think one of the key levels to watch is what happens below uh, 4,300 on the S&P. If we see that, that really does kind of uh, leave it quite wide open for us to head down to that 50-day uh, moving average for a test. So that's uh, what's going to be on my mind uh, going into uh, next week. Now, looking on page three at the dollar index, you're the technician in the house, Patrick. I have to ask, is that, a, would you interpret this as a double bottom that potentially, you know, I'm just looking at this chart. We got a bottom there right at the beginning of 2021. We got about the same bottom in, uh, in the middle of May or beginning of June. And now we're above that 50-day moving average and seems to be staying there. Is this uh, bottoms in or what do you think? Well, I, it's beyond even a double bottom. The, this kind of uh, eighty-nine ninety level is actually the bottom end of a of that five-year range on the dollar index. And just because that bottom support of of the trade range is held, does not necessarily imply that there's a new U.S. dollar bull market. Rather, that simply that the bear market in the U.S. dollar simply wasn't strong enough to be taking the dollar to all-time new lows, or at least um, uh, uh, you know decade lows, and so. So uh, what we're watching here is, is simply now that the dollar has rebounded, where is it heading on the short term in terms of the upper boundaries of resistance? Throughout uh, the last six months, the dollar index found some uh, overhead resistance in this kind of 93 to 95 zone. So I think the dollar can continue to remain in its upward movement towards some of these overhead resistance levels. But I wouldn't. I think it's a little premature to be already calling it, let's say, a new U.S. dollar bull phase. I think it's simply more like a, a ping pong match where the dollar index uh, found some key support underneath and is heading to test the top end of the range. Patrick, I couldn't agree more with your analysis. I don't think it's at all clear what the real direction of the dollar is because I don't think that the interpretation of monetary policy is uniform yet. Let's move on to page four, though. Bloomberg Commodity Index Futures. Uh, boy, looking at this chart, seems like we're beginning some kind of consolidation or at least a pause in, in the ferocious uh, rally. What's going on here? Right. And so if we go back and take it from a perspective that really since the start of the year, the U.S. dollar bear stopped declining and uh, started basing. And at the same time, the commodities uh, since that November reflation trade kicked in had an extraordinary run on the upside. And what we've seen is uh, as those really hot inflation prints uh, started coming in over the last couple months, it uh, actually surprisingly corresponded with uh, commodities sort of uh, hitting a lot of their short-term peaks. But what is interesting is the Bloomberg Commodity Index, because it's so heavily weighted toward the energy basket, has really continued to hold up very much along its highs. And, uh, and to kind of illustrate, obviously we're seeing a bit of resistance and consolidation in there. But when we look on page five on that actual crude oil chart, we can see what's really been the tailwind behind holding that commodity index higher, which is, is that crude oil kept plugging upwards toward that 77 level. And like you were suggesting, there is no evidence that a new downtrend in any way is underway. Often these types of dips in crude oil would be bought and we're going to be approaching some uh, uh, interesting support levels where uh, as we kind of get towards $70 that may end up actually being bought on dip. And so watching what happens next on crude oil is going to be a really important tell what is going to play out in that broader commodity 
Commodity Index. And I think that the way to best illustrate that is to look on page six, where what I did was uh, in the black line have the Commodity Index that we were just talking about overlaid with lumber. And I just chose one of the grains, in this case, the soybean and, uh, and like copper, just to represent some of the industrial metals. And what we really have seen is that it was in the early May that we saw peaks in all of these other commodities. And, and we are now going slowly on to two months of actual commodity consolidation outside of the energy space. And this is a really interesting um, divergence. Uh, usually, you know, I mean, crude oil really is kind of marching to the beat of its own drum here. And it'll be really interesting to see what happens next in crude, because really there is nothing holding the commodity index up outside of crude. And that really may set in motion a much broader commodity correction that can last much longer if for whatever reason crude oil did follow through on its selling. So that's one of the most important things to watch is will crude oil be bought on dip? I know you believe it will be, but I certainly think it's the most important thing to watch here going into next week. Patrick, I want to go back to your lumber chart just because this one's near and dear to my heart. I've been watching lumber futures, not because I trade them, but because I want to build a house. And uh, I've been very concerned that the cost of all construction is just crazy through the roof with this panic reaction to all kinds of people in cities moving out and buying houses in the country and so forth. I look at this chart and I say it looks to me like like this uh, this lumber price deviation is probably over and maybe planning to build a house in the next couple of years is not such a bad idea. What do you think? Well, you know what? I mean, the multi-decade range for lumber was down the two to even five hundred dollar range, and so lumber went parabolic to seventeen hundred on the upside, and we're while well, we're back down to under eight hundred, we still are more than double the kind of decade trade range. And so, while I think there, we've seen a point where lumber is incredibly oversold. It'll be really interesting to see whether or not. It still weakens a little bit from here, but we've certainly seen that that short-term supply shock that seemed to drive that parabolic rise has now been kind of worked through the system. We're starting to approach the kind of more reasonable prices, even I don't know whether anticipating lumber to return back to uh, you know, 2019 and 20 prices is realistic anymore, but uh, certainly uh, approaching the, the ranges where uh, that excess has been really worked out of the price. Well, this really goes back to Victor's comment then, doesn't it? Because if you've got Victor's view, which is that this is a pendulum swung too far and is about to return, then really we can expect cost of construction and building materials and all that stuff to come back down on the deflationary theme that Victor's told us about. If I'm right and we're at the beginning of a big 1970s size secular inflation, uh, right now is the buy the dip moment on building anything because prices are about to get a whole lot higher in the next uh, decade or so. So I, I guess it's a, a toss up. Let's keep going, though, and continue on to page seven and everybody's favorite market, which is gold. Just uh, looks like kissing the 50-day from the bottom side. What do you make of this? Right. It's interesting because yeah, we talked about how gold has kind of bounced and, and worked its way toward this 1800 level, still not in any uptrend by any means. Obviously, that big Fed hawkish tilt really took the wind out of the sails of gold. But what is interesting is uh, we've had many, many guests come on to Macro Voices talk about the correlation of gold to real yields. And one of the interesting observations on page eight to make is, is that uh, real yields on the 10-year treasuries have actually returned to being very close to minus 1% again. And all of that little scare that happened earlier um, several months ago that, that spooked the, the gold mark in the first place has uh, been almost entirely reversed. And it'll be really interesting to see whether these negative real yields stay down here and whether gold finally actually stays within its correlation and bullishly responds to that. And uh, with real yields down where they are, it'll be really interesting to see whether gold can beat ab above these moving averages and get back to like 1850 plus where the price action will start to turn more bullish here. Patrick, let's move on to the 10-year Treasury yield, not the real yield, but the nominal yield on page 9. 
Right. And so we were talking about in the market wrap and just how uh, that uh, one spot five zero on the uh, rates finally gave out. And we really see a bond rally underway as rates are just starting to break down. But what is noteworthy and what I really wanted to highlight is going beyond the, uh, the U.S. yields, because is this a, a bigger global trend? And, and, you know, is this something that is being almost a, a disinflationary sign that is happening globally? And so on page 10, I have that uh, German Bund and what we see is that while the, the throughout much of the year we went from you know uh, almost uh, minus 70 basis points on the German 10 year to uh, to almost going back to zero and here we are back to minus 30 basis points and the, and that uh, German bond yields once again rolling right back down and we take a look at the Japanese uh, 10 year yield which was uh, near zero at the start of the year had that quick jump to 20 basis points uh, in the early first few months of the year and we're right back down to zero point being here is is that that kind of bond bear that reared its head in the last six months it really is showing that uh, right around the world uh, yields are are declining and i kind of asked the question is uh, is uh, you know that pendulum swing that victor talked about are we uh, seeing the signs on a global basis that uh, that uh, the pendulum just started to swing the other way and that the reflation trade in fact has played itself out and i think that's one of the big puzzle pieces to solve here in the coming weeks and listeners you can get patrick's chart decks not just once a week but every day when you sign up for a free trial of patrick's service big picture trading you can find the information on page 12 of the chart deck or just go to bigpicturetrading.com we're going to leave it there for this week's show this episode is brought to you by abex technologies pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole and by escrow.com the world's most secure online payment system from a counterparty risk perspective because the funds sit in escrow. Patrick, tell them what they'll find eventually in this week's research roundup when the email comes through or what they can find right now by logging into the website at macrovoices.com. Well, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview as well as a link to the chart book we just discussed in the post game. You'll also find a link to an interview uh, from Bill Blaine on the importance of the one spot three four level on the yield, as well as a knowledge leader's capital article asking if the reopening and value trade is over. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. So that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners. And we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at Macro Voices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend. That's Eric spelled with a K and myself at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. 
Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.